Welcome to the Dropout Multi-Millionaire Podcast, where we talk about tactical business strategy, building high-performance sales teams, and growing your business. If you're ready to break free from the status quo and join the ranks of the Mavericks, the Rebels, and the Renegades who refuse to conform and instead build multi-million dollar businesses, then buckle up, because here we go. All right, so we've gone through box one, the introduction, and now we're going to get into box two. As you recall, box two is 70% of the sales process. This is called fact-finding. This is where the magic happens. And this is where, if done properly, your client can close themselves. Now, I keep mentioning the magic. The magic is what I say every closer has that most salespeople do not. If you remember any of my other videos, we call them closer, salespeople, and retail geese. That's another video. you got to go watch that one. The closers are the people that make things happen. They close two to three times more than every other salesperson. They just have what I've always called the magic. So what is the magic? The magic consists of five things. Number one, you have to have the ability to make people like you during the sales process, whether you're face-to-face or on the phone. You have to be likable. Number two, you have to start building trust. We talked about that in the intro box, right? Some of the the, the sedity statement and the transition are about getting people to begin to trust you. We script out the things you say in the sales process to start building trust, okay? If people start to trust you, by the way, they will also start to like you. Third, you need to come across as a professional. And by professional, I mean, you need to know what you're talking about. You need to know your product line. You need to know your competition. You need to be a consummate professional that that person is listening to and is going to believe what you tell them. Four, you need to make the client think that you are looking out for their best interests, which by the way means you need to actually look out for their best interests and not just your own. As I've always said in car sales, nobody trusts Skippy the car salesman because nobody believes when you walk on that car lot that that salesperson is looking out for your best interest, okay? In the sales situation, you need to do something, develop a script, develop a process, to make the client believe you're looking out for their best interest. If you remember the intro, once again, we were gonna make a recommendation based on questions and then let them decide. That means I'm looking out for your best interest. And finally, what ties all this together is the connection. You need to figure out how to make a connection with that client. And I mean a personal connection. And when I say that, it can be anything. In my case, I was in the military. So somehow I can bring up the military and see if they react. I've got like two kids that just graduated from college. Do they have children? I can make a chop a, a children connection. Uh, I used to be in the landscaping business. I can talk about people's yards. Uh, there's a million things you can talk about. No matter what they do, you need to figure out a connection. I've often said, if they're in the pharmaceutical business, I'll say, hey, what kind of drugs do you sell? And can I get any free samples? Make them laugh. You will make a connection. If you can make the connection, make sure that they think you are looking out for their best interest. They will begin to trust you. You come across as a professional. They will begin to like you. That is the magic. And that is what will make you sell two to three to four times what anybody else will make. Don't be a robot. Don't just read scripts. Don't go out there just pitching the benefits of your product. Make a connection with somebody and your sales closing. So that's the overview of the magic. Now let's get into some of the specifics of the fact finding because there are some things you need to do in order to accomplish those, but also accomplish your overall goal of finding out everything we need to know. And the very first thing I'm going to tell you about this, and this this relates to every sale of any product, anywhere, anytime. You need to learn to have a conversation. Don't act like a salesperson. This conversation piece is a difference between you sounding like a professional and you sounding like a cheesy salesperson. And I use this funny example of a guy who sells, or yeah, he he gets people to invest in apartments, right? You all know who I'm talking about, massive organization all over the internet. And I called into his organization one day and they were trying to sell some program. And the kid that got on the phone kept asking me the same stupid questions over and over. What's your pain point? What problem are you trying to solve? And his tone and inflection went up an octave from where he probably normally talked. He kept repeating the same scripted line. And I kept saying, listen, stop with the script 
and just have a conversation with me. I just want to talk about what you guys do, what product you're trying to sell and how it works. Well, what pain point are you trying to solve? Well, how can I help you solve your problem? Okay, that, that is a cheesy sales line and it doesn't work. And so and I ended up hanging up on the guy, right? Learn to have a conversation. Master salespeople have conversations. If you can learn the sales process by just talking to somebody, just like you'd be talking to somebody if it was your friend. If your friend was sitting on the couch next to you watching the football game and said, hey, what do you guys do again? You wouldn't go, oh my gosh, what problem are you trying to solve? What's your pain point? I'm going to help you with your pain point. It's not what you would do. You would say, oh, well, I sell X, Y, Z, and this is what it does, and this is how I help people. Why? Are you interested? Okay. That's having a conversation. Learn to have a conversation. All right. So we're having a conversation. What do we need to find out? We need to find out why this customer is here, why they need this product, and then we need to find out when they need this product. This is critical. I need to know why they're looking and when they're looking, right? By the way, a lot of times customers will come in and say, oh, I'm just looking. Really? It's like going to a restaurant, sitting at a table, and the waitress comes up and you say, no, I'm not hungry. I'm just going to hang out here for a while and watch people eat. OK, that doesn't make any sense. Or people don't just get up randomly on a Saturday morning and say, hey, hey, honey, I'm bored. Let's go down to the car lot and shop for cars that we have no intent of buying. OK, that's a lie, by the way. We'll get into the lie and hide later. But I need to know why they're here. I need to know why they're looking at my product. I need to know when they're looking to buy my product. Now, it's true. Some people will say, oh, we're looking in six months, but I'm going to shop now. If I can figure that out early on, I'm not going to spend a heck of a lot of time with that person. The opposite of that is a salesperson who doesn't find out the when and they spend hours or even follow-up call hours chasing down somebody who has no intention of buying anytime soon. And that's a waste. And by the way, we get into this in another video I did, your close rate. If you're only going to close 25% of your sales, that means 75% of the people you talk to are never going to buy. You need to figure that out. If you can figure out the people that aren't going to buy, you can move through the people that are going to buy much faster. And one of the ways you do that is finding out when they're looking. I need to know why, and I need to know when. Okay, now, as part of that why when, I now want to know who my competition is. I know who the general competition is. I want to know who my competition is with this particular client. Let's say, for example, we're selling solar panels, okay? I would say, have you looked at any other solar panel companies? Have you looked at any of the people out there that are also selling what I sell? And if their answer is yes, I've already looked someplace else. Now I want to know why they didn't buy. So I'll say, well, who did you look with? And they'll say, well, XYZ company. And my answer is, they are a pretty good company, right? I'm not going to trash my competition. The first thing out of my mouth is, oh, they suck because that makes me sound like a salesperson, makes me sound like a cheesy salesperson. I'm going to say they're a pretty good company. Why didn't you buy their product? This is an opportunity for the client to now tell me what's wrong with the competition. Well, I didn't like this or I didn't like that. By the way, I'm building my repertoire of things they don't like so that I'm not going to go down that same road and I'm going to overcome those objections when I get to my presentation and close. Or I didn't like the salesperson. Oh my gosh, I know a couple of the guys over there. What didn't you like? And they're going to tell me what they didn't like. And once again, I'm building that up in my mind, overcoming future objections. They can't come back later and tell me, I'm going to go look at the competition, or I still need to consider the competition if they just sat there and told me what was wrong with the competition. Okay. I try to build the competition up. They tell me what's wrong with the competition. So who have you shopped with? I shopped with XYZ. Oh my gosh, they're a good company. Why didn't you buy from them? Well, I had this problem and this problem and this problem. All right, well, I understand that. Now let me see how I can help you, okay? So who's my competition? Did they shop? Why didn't they buy? Was it price? Was it product? Was it the salesperson? These are all objections they may have later that I'm gonna overcome now by asking the question in my conversation, in my fact-finding phase, all right? That's the competition. So we've talked about the competition. We've asked them why they didn't shop there. Next question, well, what brought you into me today? Why are you here? Why are you shopping with us? Why did you come see me? What I want them to tell me 
a minute ago, I wanted them to tell me what was wrong with the competition. Now I want them to tell me why they are here. What is it about my product that brought them in? What is it about my advertising that brought them in? Was it a referral that brought them in? Did they talk to one of my other customers? Is that why they're here? I want them to tell me why they're here and why I'm better than the competition. Does that make sense? So have you shopped for the product? Yes, you have, with XYZ company. Why didn't you buy there? I had XYZ problem. Oh my gosh, that's terrible. What brought you in to see me today? Well, I heard from so-and-so that you guys had a good product and a good price. Okay, once again, building in my head, I'm allowing them to tell me how good I am while telling me how bad my competition is. This is subtle master sales techniques that you need to learn how to do. Having a conversation, just let it your tongue, okay? Why are you here? Why'd you come see me? Tell me how great I am. So now I want to get into a tough one, and this is the budget. So many salespeople fail in this budget question because they ask it the wrong way and they don't understand what's going to happen in the client's mind when they ask. This is a typical conversation. So, Mr. Client, what's your budget for these solar panels? Oh, well, I'm only looking to spend X. Now, let me ask you something. As a consumer yourself, when somebody asks you how much you want to spend, do you actually tell them or do you lie to them? And you don't lie high, you lie low. No different than me on a car lot and Skippy says, you like this car? What can you afford in a monthly payment? Well, that's a stupid question. The car costs what it costs. What he wants you to do is set a bar of a payment, right? That might be higher than what the payment would actually be. So he can raise the price of the car through some trickery they do in the finance department. I never ask a budget question. I never ask it because I know the client's going to lie. And if I know the client's going to lie and lowball me, why would I ask the question in the first place? That makes no sense. That's an open-ended, stupid question. Don't ever do that. Here's how you do do it, though. Okay? I would say, okay, so you didn't like the competition. You came here because uh, somebody told you we had good product and pricing. Our products range from $5,000 at the very base level to $35,000 at the very high end level. Now, I can spend all day telling you about every single one of our product lines and variations, but that doesn't make any sense. So between 5,000 and 35,000, where would you like me to plug in what we're gonna talk about today? What would you like to hear about? What price range inside my parameters work for you? Now they can't lowball me. They can't say, well, I'm only looking for 4,000 because I already told them my bottom, bottom dollar is five, right? They're certainly not gonna tell me more than 35 because that doesn't make sense. I've given them a range that they're gonna pigeonhole themselves into and by the way, I'm overcoming an objection later that my price is too high because I allowed them to set the price or the budget within the parameters that I gave them. Okay. If they set the budget within the parameters, I can overcome that objection later. Plus, we'll get into something here later about bottom dollar alternatives and follow ups and whatnot that'll help me as well. Now, my client comes back and says, Well, gosh, I don't know. What's the difference between 5,000 and 35,000? I don't know solar panel, so I can't answer that question, but I would say something like, this is my very bottom dollar. I will tell you a lot of people come in at about the fifteen dollars to $20,000 level. If that's something you're comfortable with, I can explain that one to you. If you want to go a little lower, let me know. Or if you want to go more high end, you let me know. And generally they will say, let's talk about the one at fifteen dollars to $20,000. Great. I've now allowed them to set the price. I have a product that fits within that range and I've overcome the future objection of that's too expensive. Okay. So we set the parameters, we don't ask the budget. What's your budget? How much are you looking to spend? Terrible question, they will lie. Your product is between 5,000 and 35,000. Where would you like me to begin? It allows them to set the budget. Make sense? Okay. All right, let's wrap up this episode. In this episode, we talked about the magic. You gotta make people like you, trust you. You need to come across as a professional. You need to make sure they think you're looking out for their best interest. And you need to make that connection. We talked about doing everything in conversation mode. Don't sound like a cheesy salesman. Don't raise your voice an octave. Don't ask stupid questions. Don't be a cheesy salesman. Just have a conversation. We talked about our competition, right? Who's our competition? Have you shopped there? Did you get a price? Why did you not buy? Let them tell you why they didn't buy from somebody else. It allows you to build in your mind what you're not going to do. We talked about the why and the when. Why are they here? Why are they here to see you? Why are they buying this product? What are they going to use it for? And then when are they planning on buying? We need to know those things. We talked about the budget parameters, right? 
Don't ask for a budget. Don't ask them what they want to spend. They're going to lie to you. You give them a, a, a range. We set the parameters. My products cost between $500 to $1,000. Are you comfortable at the top of the line? Do you want to talk about the bottom of the line or somewhere in the middle? Let them choose the price range, okay? And this last piece, which is a redundant one, in everything you're talking through, in every question you ask, you need to make that connection, okay? And connections can be where you're from, what you do, what the spouse does, what your spouse does. I'm from Ohio. Are you from the Midwest? I grew up in a small town. Did you grow up in a small town? I'm from a farm community. I was in the military. I've sold things. I've sold other things besides what we're talking about here. I worked in private equity. I worked in venture capital. I've done so many things. There's there's ultimately something you can make that connection. And if you make that connection through active listening, right? Listen to what they're telling you and respond to it. You make that connection and the whole thing will come together and you'll be ready at the end of the fact-finding stage to move into presentation and get them to that close. So that wraps up this episode. Join us for the next episode of the Dropout Multimillionaire. And if you want more information on what we're talking about, once again, you can get my book. It's called No. The Psychology of Sales and Negotiation, which is what we're going through here. You can go to my website, brianwildmedia.com. You can join our, our Force Multiplier Mastermind or I'm available for one-on-one -on -one coaching for your organization, your specific product, your specific scripts, your specific sales team. We can make it. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you would like to get more information on either of my books, joining the Force Multiplier Mastermind or my one-on-one -on -one coaching programs, you can find me at www.brianwillmedia.com.